that. This is Ray Cuyasa. You're watching and listening to the Founding Translation Bomba Life Simulcast. Founding Translation is a show that stacks truth about politics. It's the hottest issue. The truth sometimes is found in allyship, and that's one of the big things of today's show. Later on in the show, we're going to have an interview with Filipina activist Argentina Beltran just on that issue. How do we show allyship with the Filipino, not only Filipino American community, but the Filipino diaspora throughout the world? Our Pacific Islanders are particularly being impacted by the scourge of anti-AAPI hate. Hashtag stop the hate, Asian hate. And so we want to, we have a very diverse set of Asian American and Pacific Island activists having part of this conversation. And we'll get into some of the political headlines later on in the show. But first, I want to introduce um, a great friend to the show, someone that we've been living the lyrics with for a little while now, since our college years. And she's going to help us not only uh, her perspective on uh, how in our, my case, as Latinos, as many of our audience members, as non-Asian Americans, uh, can show allyship with the Asian American community at this very critical time in their history, and catch us up also as a Minnesota activist about the climate and sort of what she's seeing and observing from the Derek Chauvin trial, uh, that lessons we can learn as we continue to, to try to support each other from a BIPOC perspective. So, uh, And then we'll have other special guests join in a moment. But first, let's introduce my buddy. A very special guest to the show, activist Liz Kaufman. Liz, finally, welcome to Bomba Live. Liz, it's been way overdue, my friend. How are you? Sorry. Yes, it's a, really great to be here. I'm really excited. Thank you for having me. No, let me tell you something. One of the I I don't get to Minnesota as often as I'd like, but me and Liz keep in touch. Me and Liz are part of a very exclusive Instagram message group, <laughs> and you would think with all of these, you know, activists, educators. I mean, you know, it's such a diverse group of people. You know what we end up IGing about? Also hip hop. Yeah. So shout out to our IG group, Augie, Tony, the whole crew, because uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get into that, Liz, at some point. Liz, it's great to see you. Uh, You have been really a leader in this conversation for as long as I've known you. Um, And uh, I thought it was very appropriate that not only during this time in our history, where the Asian American community... uh, in this unfortunate circumstance, it's sort of in the spotlight, but also it's Asian American History Month. So we want to celebrate the great contributions of our AAPI community with our country. So, Liz, before we introduce our other guests, and and uh, Albert Garcia is going to be part of this conversation, our producer as well. You know, beyond anything, you're a Minnesotan, and you're a Minnesota social justice activist. So just from the perspective of someone that, you know, pre Philando Castile even was engaged in these issues around policing and social justice in the in the Twin Cities, just your observations on the climate locally and just how you're feeling as an activist uh, as the Derek Chauvin trial uh, progresses. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's the Chauvin trial has just been difficult on multiple levels. Um, and I have been following these issues for, um, I guess, maybe about 25 years. Um, and the, the work that I did um, was largely in New York, but I've tried to stay engaged with um, with what's happening um, so first I just want to, um, extend my condolences to the family and friends of George Floyd, um, and all of us who are grieving. Um, it's really just been a, a difficult time. Um, the whole world watched, um, Derek Chauvin, uh, kill George Floyd. Um, and it's, it's really just over the last year pointed to, um, how many lives have been impacted Um, and the amount of pain that our communities are living with. Um, I've only been able to watch clips of the trial. It's, there's really just a lot there and it's, it's pretty, um, re-traumatizing to watch. Um, and so a couple of clips that come to mind, um, were one of a, a first responder who was not allowed by the police, um, to carry out her duties to assist George Floyd Um, And then also um, some testimony of bystanders, um, witnesses who um, have just spent spent the past year um, just really thinking about what they wish they would have done. And it's it's really just a a horrible, traumatic um, thing to put people through um, where they're taking it, you know, upon themselves and internalizing it because um, because they were there and. so one way, you know, racism works is it, it makes um, a, a, an example of people on a public stage to say, you know, this is what can happen to you. Um, and people just, you know, we relive it over and over. Um, so it's, it's just been traumatizing from 
the murder to how it was handled afterwards. Um, they wanted to move the trial out of the Twin Cities. The way that they handled the jury selection, um, they were looking for people who um, either uh, didn't know about the case or didn't have an opinion. And that's a really strong political position. That's not neutral. That, that's a political position. Um, mm. And so that's that's what the system is. And the larger trauma is that we've seen this happen over and over. And I thought a lot about the Diallo trial um, in New York and um, just the pattern of, you know, no charges or a move trial, no conviction, shortened sentences. And it brings us to the larger root question of what is justice? Uh, what do we envision? How do we build it? Because it's not found in the carceral system. Wow. And uh, that's a very powerful statement, Liz. And, you know, you know, as you as you were talking, talking about the trauma that the witnesses, just people that were standing on the street. And at the end of the day, regardless of what the, what the, the defendants trying to say, they never attacked the police. They never got real aggressive with the police. They were just there and trying to be human beings at this moment. Right. And and I think about it. I don't talk about it much on the show because it's more my dad's story. But uh, I was there. My I, me and my dad were just hanging out, basically uh, going to going to a social event. And uh, we got caught in the crossfire. My dad got hit and I didn't. And, you know, it was because, thank God, it was a low caliber uh, gun. And uh, and, you know, he's a it was hit. It hit him in the right spot and he was able to survive it. Um, And, uh, you know, we've gone through, uh, you know, I've gone through guilt over the years because I'm like, you know, he kind of took one for me, you know, and uh, and just being the trauma of that moment and thinking about the trauma that he went through. Because there was a moment where we had gotten separated in the melee and him not knowing if I'd got shot or not. I'm a little skinny 13 year old kid. So, you know, who would have known if that bullet had hit me in the wrong spot? So, you know, there's so much trauma in the inner city that we go through that gets ignored uh, oftentimes by the, our our community from a, not only a policing perspective, but like a, a mental health perspective. Liz, what else should people know? You know, it's been, you know, about a year now. And, you know, we dedicated a big part of our first annual Bomba Live Puerto Rican celebration to the memory of George Floyd. Uh, we had Maria Isa, one of your sisters up in Minnesota, be one of our performers. She knew him personally. She did a Bomba, which is traditional Afro-Puerto Rican music uh, song in his honor during the program. So we really focused on it. But, you know, nearly a year later, just being a Minnesota activist, what? how are people feeling up there? I mean, th- we're like reliving it all over again, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's a combination of the, the intensity of um, – of what happened last year, how everything kind of played out. Um, and just, you know, thinking about what, what will happen as the, the trial proceeds. Um, and then I think also there's all the work that's going on. Um, there's lots of, you know, grassroots movement work that's been happening. That's always happening. And I think, um, you know, that we find our, our hope in that, um, and really, you know, reaching out for, um, New connections, uh, building relationships, um, really looking at root causes of issues, um, and just knowing that we need a broad-based, multiracial, intergenerational, um, cross-issue movement for us to win. Um, and it's it's just it's become apparent um, that we just we need to keep building. The system is going to keep playing out the way it does, um, and we just we just have to keep uh, building with each other. Um, well. Forward. Allyship and building and solidarity and really what's real solidarity because that's been an interesting conversation that we've been all going through and I think on some level, for lack of a better term, struggling with over the last several weeks, particularly as it relates to supporting the Asian American community. And another brother that, and I call him a brother because he's a friend and someone that really is is, is uh, really schooling us around how do we develop these collaborations and, and, and what true allyship means. I want to bring to the show activists and um and, and really a great thinker as it relates to these issues, our great friend, Ben Cheng. Ben, what's up, brother? Ben, smile. If I was that handsome, I would be smiling from ear to ear all the time. How are you, my friend? I think you're on uh, uh, I think you're on mute, brother. You know, it wouldn't be a virtual show without you know, me and Liz doing the same thing. So that, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be back. I appreciate you, brother. And uh, in my... my, my my ride or die brother, producer of the show, and someone that shares a very special anniversary with me and Liz, Elber Garcia, brother. Guess who's back, back again. Guess who's back, tell a friend. Guess who's back, guess who's back. Elber, what's up, brother? 
I'm trying to not, not, you know, I was going to think about maybe muting my mic just so that I could like flow into the same conversation. No. Um, exactly. Yeah. No, always a pleasure to be here with uh, with you, Ray, and always a pleasure to, to hang out, um, you know, with Liz. Great to meet you, Ben. Um, I tell you, it's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's we're living in in really important times. Um, and it's good to know that that folks like y'all are, are really hanging out there and really um, you know, on the front lines of the work that needs to be done. So before we get to the anniversary, the first the, the special anniversary of three of us here, many other activists, Ben I'm gonna school you about how down Liz is. Liz is one of the realest in the game. You don't understand. I mean, you just got the tip of the iceberg. Two thousand. I'm at the Democratic National Convention in LA. And, you know, I'm a young activist. Me and my buddy score one ticket for the DNC. So we literally take turns outside the Staples Center going in and out of the convention. I get kicked out of the SEIU VIP suite. They're like, who's this boy? He's not one of the state directors of our union. Get the hell out of here. All this craziness. We end up connecting after the, the convention, after Al Gore spoke, right? 2000, right? Yeah, Al Gore spoke, mean. a group of activists. We end up connecting some of our LA friends, Tony and Augie and the whole crew that are watching this. And I said, oh, so Liz said, so what are you doing here? Like, I'm an act, you know, I'm in voter registration, Latino, trying to work. And yeah, so I was at Stable Center. I, I said, what have you done here? She goes, I'm outside protesting for Puerto Rican political prisoners to be released. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, small Liz made me feel like, damn, I ain't, I ain't real. I ain't real. Liz is real. Much love to your sister. Albert, you know, you were as central to it as any of us. Um, the three of us and dozens of of uh, Asian American and Latino and, and students of color and others, other allies, Cele uh, Columbia alum celebrated a very special 25th, 25 year anniversary recently. So why don't you share with us, Albert, uh, that, that, that moment in the spring in our college years that we wanted to share a moment about today? Yeah, you know, I, I just wanna kind of put this up. So April 1st, 1996, um, a bunch of Columbia students, really a, a coalition, right, of, of Asian American, African American and Latino students, um, began a hunger strike, right, for a combined um, a combined ethnic studies department, right, because for, for years and really decades, uh, the university had um, had kind of given short change. They said that they were kind of promising not only to increase, um, you know, classes um, for the Institute for African American Studies, um, but also promising to support, uh, you know, other programs. And after several years of fits and starts, um, a, you know, a coalition of, 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 of grad students and undergrads um, just got tired. And, you know, we had been, you know, really kind of working and meeting, um, you know, meeting with different coalitions and committees and faculty committees and things of that nature for a while. And, um, and we decided just to, to, to take some action, right? And, and, um, and again, a lot of it was the administration just not thinking um, that, that, that they could basically, you know, kind of ride out these student activists that they had done years and years and years um, for a while, and 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 uh, and we did. So a coalition of folks um, decided to kind of start that, and it started. Um, if I if I remember right, started. I think a, I think it ended up being uh, a sixteen a sixteen day hunger strike, um, and it had a number of different even mini actions. Um, we took over Broadway at some point. Um, yeah. We um, we took off. Uh, ultimately, we took over um, the main administration building, um, which was Low Library. Um, we took that um, for about you know for about 14 hours until New York City police um, came in on campus. It had been the first time since 1968 that um, that New York City police had been on Columbia's campus since the anti-war movement. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, there were 23 arrests that day. 22 of them were women. Um, in terms of you know throwing down to the both our Barnard. Um, sisters as well as Columbia women um, being arrested. Um, and eventually, you know, the hunger strike led to um, a number of different things. It's certainly um, the formation of the, you know, Latino studies major and Asian American studies majors there, some commitments to, um, to faculty, um, and eventually a, a center for studies and race, ethnicity, ethnicity and race, right? So certainly a bunch of things that started. Um, and the other thing that's important too is that it was part of a wave of different folks of color at different Ivy League colleges that were um, that were really, um, you know, that, that were really trying to take over and trying to, you know, kind of push their institutions to do better, right? The year before had been a very famous Asian, Asian American and Latino um, studies takeover at Princeton, um, in which um, they took over the president's office there, in which we were inspired by. Um, 
And even the year before that, there had been one at, at Cornell. Um, and the Harvard folks tried to do that, I think, as well. And they, and they kind of kind of similarly got shut down. Um, but these are still issues, still issues in terms of academic access and fighting white supremacy. Um, so much so that even last year, um, you know, Harvard students um, had taken over, at least for a short amount of time before the pandemic, their presence office to try to demand, uh, you know, an ethnic studies um, department or these curriculum over there. So, um, but it all started 25 years ago on April 1st. It was no April Fools um, before, you know, before, you know, just when emails were starting, before, you know, Instagram, before really like major internet stuff was, you know, pretty much, you know, us kind of on those battle lines. God, it's it's we could sit here and the, the lessons and the 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 I mean really there needs to be a documentary done about it. We could throw all the names out of the wonderful people that were part of it. But but with the time that we have, Liz, just your reflections, thinking about those experiences. What what does that what does that time period what did that time period teach to you that you that you take with you to continue your work? Yeah, um, you know, I think about that time a lot. It was one of the most impactful um experiences in my life. Uh, moving to New York from the Twin Cities at 18, and then coming into this really vibrant um, movement that was happening. And uh, so I think the uh, one of the most powerful parts for me was just the um, the, the multiracial aspect of it, the fact that, um, that students were really um, just taking their own power, um, learning from each other. There were teach-ins. Um, you know, everything was just was just driven from the, the students, um, the whole strategy. Um, and it, it just moved through, like, you know, all the different tactics that we use. Um, and it, I think it really was an example of, of democracy. Um, and it's so I, I think about it quite a bit. You know, and again, there'll be other ta- other I'm sure documentarians and scholars will document this. And at some point we'll all get interviewed about it. Um, but I, I remember how hard it was. And I'm saying that in a positive way because there was, you know, we were all coming from, even you know, even though we're all people of color, we're all coming. And I'm not even talking about the ethnic part. We're all coming from very different places. Some of us were hood kids. Some of us were kind of in the middle. Some of us grew up, you know, fairly well to do. Some of us were ideological. Some of us were practical. So, you know, different movements sort of layered in. I mean, it seems like it took, it was it sort of built, April 1st was a buildup of about a semester. And so in the middle of this movement, there was, we then had a lot of intersectional conversations around gender identity and that probably looking back on it, we're very sort of ahead of its time in a sense. Um, and, you know, just a lot of ideal ideology and just a lot of things that were hard to get through and just the opera. And then really this is sort of like, you know, the BC level of the internet where it was basically an email campaign. And so just lots of lessons. Um, ben, I want to get you in this conversation because we fast forward to today and allyship, is more important than ever. And so uh, obviously, you know, we, we, we stand in, in uh, solidarity with the Floyd family, but now moving to the conversation related to, you know, the Asian American community is literally physically under attack and all of this ugliness that we often don't like to talk about as it relates to the othering of the Asian American community, um, the dehumanization, the, 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 the invisibility. Um, and so just, just want to get your initial reflections on, how you're feeling, brother, on a personal level, and and what's this moment um, as an activist and a and someone that's focused on building allyship? You know your thoughts on on this moment right now. Absolutely, Ray. I appreciate the time and and the thoughts. Um, so so for me, you know, I, I think it it really hits hard, and I think I can speak for uh, some of our, our our you know our API community in that I think for for the one thing that comes to mind is that you know, it, it is, you know, you bring up the fir- the othering, right? And the othering has to do a little bit with like the traditional silence of our communities. And I think in my perspective, the silence has a lot to do with the way we were raised, like our parents coming in and their values growing up. I was taught in the face of conflict, right? We, we just walk away. We don't speak up. And in, in face of what, what we want to get to, you know, we just sort of work hard, put our head down, work hard and hope it sort of works out. Um, and, and when I'm hearing Albert's story, uh, you know, I think it helps me realize, uh, for one, right, this is not a zero sum game, right? It, it's, it's all these communities coming together uh, for a common goal. And, and I think uh, among the API community now, 
there I've seen an awakening um, among my friends, not just academics, but, you know, across all industries, just it, it doesn't even cut that way. Right. It's just just talking and, and thinking about how we can speak up. And we we're having conversations about how and actually with our parents and they're saying, why are you speaking up? And we're saying we have to speak up. Right. Like we have to speak up to to live. Right. And, and so for us, it's almost like. I don't want to, I don't want to, like, it's, it's for the first time that, that, that I hate that it's taken this tragic, awful event, you know, in Atlanta to, to sort of quote unquote awaken some people, but it, it really has. And I'm having deep conversations with some friends that I never thought even thought about these issues. You know what? I think it's, it's, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's my, been my observation. Mm -hmm. And I think there's two pieces here and I want to get your thoughts on this, Ben, is that one, I think on some level, like, you know, the fact that, you know, well, I think the biggest, one of the biggest dynamics in this is that in particular, the attacks on the Asian American elderly community, because not only kind of like on any, on a, on a personal level, and I know my Asian American brothers are particularly like, are you messing with my mom? You met, you know, like there's a visceral piece there, but then culturally, obviously everyone honors their, 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 their elders, but the Asian American Pacific Island community, I mean, that is such a tenet of y'all culture across the board. So can you speak to like the just just extrapolate what you just talked about in terms of like what are now what's now the conversation happening within the community around now what what do you do and what can yeah. you know you do now yeah. to 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 just first of all protect the family but right. also now how does this elevate more conversation around visibility and Absolutely. power with the Asian American community Absolutely um I mean it you're you're absolutely spot on, Ray. I mean, our our elderly community, our parents, that generation, we are taught to respect them to the highest degree. You know, so when we're watching these horrific videos, it it sort of hits a core. I'm not saying it doesn't affect other communities as well, but from that perspective, it really hits us uh, very deeply and, and very very sensitively. And so there has been there have been organizing events where, at, you know. From the simplest, like, let's just check in with our parents, make sure they're OK. Right. Like, I mean, we're all in the quarantine, but let's just check in all the way to organizing, like people making sure uh, people are going to, to nursing homes and elderly communities and, and walking with them, like setting up systems. So they need they need to go somewhere, either drive them there or walk with them and try to try to you know strengthen the community that way. Um, and, and, and and I think uh you know, in terms of visibility and what to do, you know, I want to give a shout out to my my Latina sister, Judy Perez Caro, who's on the show, too, who is my my business partner. Uh, and we have a DNI consulting business, Perez and Chang. Um, but she has taught me, right, that that we we have, you know, in, in terms of speaking up in visibility. Right. We we need to start to take up space. Right. Uh, and I think that's that's been a lot of this conversation where like in some ways when, when, when our communities are featured on the news, a lot of times it's something we want to shy away from. We don't want to draw that attention, but I think we want to have more conversation in the API community of, of taking up space, of showing the spotlight and attending things like, you know, bystander trainings and, and teaching, uh, you know, which is a strategy to teach, you know, onlookers to distract or, uh, to do indirectly or directly insert themselves. Right. We want to, we want to break that sort of silence and we want to break that, natural sort of uh freezing uh response that we have that that we that sort of you know we i'll speak from the eye perspective that i was taught uh to to in how to react Rick, I think, yes Rick, I, I was about to say that i think it's also important to remember that it's, it's re-tapping in that tradition and history of activism right because i think it would be a mistake to to think that this is something new right um and i think that's what's so so kind of flipped and weird, right, about the world that we live in, that how quickly we can kind of forget that, right? Um, and so I think that's part of it is really kind of tapping into, into, I think what was so great about that experience back at Columbia was also knowing, and it was was relearning in some ways that history, right? Um, and, his, and in terms of both in the current sense and also in the traditional sense, right? In terms of, you know, Asian American um, men and women, right, who were on the front lines, right, of the civil rights movement in terms of civil rights, uh, you know, uh, episodes, not just in the United States, but also in terms of activism around the world, in terms of their own countries. And, and, and in some ways, the story of not just in terms of being silent, but also being silenced, right? And in terms of the, the, the Asian American activism 
tradition that there is that I think that 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 you would be hard pressed to sometimes find, and um, but that is there, right? And especially the longstanding, um, unfortunately, tradition of hate, right, towards you know levied against the Asian American community, Asian, you know, the API community, certainly obviously starting first from, you know, in terms of the Chinese Exclusionary Act um, and a whole bunch of things, right? And, so, and kind of retapping into that, right? I mean, and again, people will be surprised to know that when it comes to like modern feminism, like Asian American women were there at the forefront with black women in terms of creating around like reproductive justice and reproductive access, right? I mean, there's a bunch of tradition in terms of there that I think, you know, it, it's also important um, that also we create space for folks to also rediscover and be proud of that kind of that stuff. Because I think literally um, the Asian American community, like a, you know, a number of other communities in the United States have had their history also suppressed and repressed as well. Well, and it's about not, not remembering your history. And so I think about 2015, 2016, when Trump's anti-Mexican, anti-Latino rhetoric, anti-immigrant, anti-other rhetoric got into a fever pitch during the campaign. And the conventional wisdom by some people on the right saying, well, you know, he's just kind of saying this, but he's not going to really have a have an administration like that. And George Takai, the child of, of an internment camp, sounding the alarm saying, oh, in this country, you can get that bad because I lived through it. And most of us, you know, not saying us, but just most Americans just really just not thinking that's inconceivable that this could happen. Fast forward. What happens to these children on the southern border? and many other in this climate of fear and hate building to this crescendo. Liz, before we go to our first break, Liz, I've been thinking a lot about you in this situation because on a personal level, it's got to, this has to be an interesting time for you as an activist, as a lifer, because you've always been there for everybody else, Latinos, African-Americans, other progressive causes, women. And now this is an opportunity, almost a, I don't want to say a unique opportunity, but, but a special moment in time when, all of us have to be there for the Asian American community. And I'm sure in Minnesota, people are looking to you for guidance and, and some leadership. So just what are your thoughts on you being such a, on the forefront of allyship and now you having to, to navigate being a, essentially a recipient of it. Yeah. Um, so I, I was going to add some of the same context um, that LB was, was talking about um, as far as um, Asian American or uh, anti-Asian violence um, really, um, uh, having a roots in like since since um, Asian folks um, first started coming here um, in the 1700s, and so um, you know we have the coolie trade um, that used the same ships that transported enslaved Africans. Um, we have law after law denying rights. Um, you know Asian Americans couldn't go to white schools. They had extra taxes. They couldn't testify against whites. Um, couldn't intermarry. You know we have scapegoating and mass killings. Um, gender-based violence and, you know, examples of specific targeting, like you were mentioning um, about the mass incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans. Um, and so this moment is occurring in a history of dehumanization, um, exploitation, and systemic violence. Um, and uh, it's the same system of white supremacy and oppressive structures um, that target and attack, uh, perpetuate racism and discrimination against other marginalized communities. Um, and so I think, you know, we find in history that wherever there is oppression, there's also resistance. And so even though, you know, we have been invisibilized and um, there's been, you know, erasure and attempts at erasure and suppression um, of our stories, um, it's, it's there's still our stories nonetheless and people still know them. And so um, building with each other in a way um, where we are able to tap into that um, and listen to each other. Um, find elders, find folks who know some of the things that aren't um, necessarily in the media. Um, and then coming back to all those moments in history where we've stood together, um, you know, from like the farm workers movement, um, the, our overlapping issues um, with the, the camps, you know, as you have mentioned, uh, with issues around documentation, workers rights, housing. Um, we've always lived and worked together in the same communities. Um, and there's just there's so much richness there. Um, and so many, so many times where folks have, have really built together. Um, and so I think in times where the system is trying to really push divisiveness, um, this is our moment to really tap into um, what we know of history and not get caught up in, um, you know, whatever the, the mainstream sort of media hype is um, 
And so we continue the, the legacies that are important to us um, and that we know we need to survive. And and that's it's never stopped. It's not like it comes in spurts. Thinking about the ongoing immigration battle, which in particular is coming to a head as it relates to, uh, you know, really a, a very diverse set of immigrant, immigrant activist stakeholders. Thinking about our great friend who was part of the ethnic studies mood, Aijin Poo, who's been on the forefront of worker of domestic workers and, you know, the, the, that home care campaign that she's kicked off which I'm looking forward to support her on. There's a big kickoff on Saturday. We'll be more on social media. And, you know, so it's it's never ended. There's always been this allyship. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to play a, a short video clip of a musical performance of our great mutual friend, Liz, Maria Issa, one of your great Minnesota activists, uh, who, again, did a, on Bomba Live last year, did an ode to your, his her personal friend as well, George Floyd. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Ben and Liz, so what does allyship look like? Y'all got to school us because I don't want to assume we know what true allyship look like. Obviously there's a lot of levels to it. And, but I think it's an important takeaway that we really get from our two great friends here, what we need to do moving forward to tr- truly show solidarity with the Asian American community in their time of need, because we're with the AAPI brothers and sisters a thousand percent here on Bumba Life Found Translations. Here a little bit from Maria Issa. She breaks it down and we'll come back and talk to Ben and Liz on this very uh, special edition of Bumba Life. Fuego, que fuego. So much respect to her. Support her music. Uh, I mean, she's always coming out with, with independent music up there as an activist, as a fantastic po- contest, Rona, a Latina, thera- Latina therapy, I think it's called. Um, and so definitely support her. And we're looking to have her back on the show very soon. Um, so let's start with you, Ben. So look, well, I'm going to have a confession. I was, I felt awkward about the whole thing. I'm going to be honest with you because I'm supposed to know what to do. So when everything started going down, and people said, you know, like, I just thought I did what I thought I was supposed to do. And I reached out to friends like Liz. I said, hey, you know, you know, what up? Hey, just on a personal level, I want to make sure you're cool and, and others. And then, you know, and again, I don't I don't want to sound embarrassed saying this, but I just want to be honest with you. Like, I took my dad out to eat and we both were like, hey, we should go to Chinatown and represent, you know, you know it sounds like kind of corny trait, but I'm just being honest. Well, we're both hot pot nuts. So if we can find a hot pot. That's where we're going to be. So, so we went down there and we just, you know, we just wanted to be in, in community of fellowship and, and get a good meal. So I, you know, I'm making light of the situation, but I think, you know, I want to really help us understand like what's nice, but what's really impactful. And so, you know, so Ben, why don't you start? And I know Liz has some thoughts on it. So, so Ben, for people, whether they're Latino or whatever, yeah. whatever their background, they just want to show allyship and support for the API community in this moment. So just, just some thoughts on that topic. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love hot pot as just much as much as the next person. Now so he's I, bugging me because I told him about a Korean one and, the, and his name that was closer to him. And now I'm like, hey, COVID, they're not opening it, but it's enough. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, I mean, supporting your, your Asian American API business is always a good, good start. Um, I think, you know, what you mentioned, uh, you know, at the, the, the smallest touch point, reaching out right to you, to your peers, your friends, um, sending them a note. Like I, I luck, you know, I'm blessed to have great friends who reach out to me just just saying hey um i'm with you what you know what can i do right asking that is always a great first step i, I mean i want to go back to to sort of what what albert was saying before and, and and i think one great step is just uh in terms of allyship is understanding the history right understanding the history of, of your brothers and sisters regardless you know of your of your community again i want to go back to you know the the, the focus on that this is not a zero sum game, right? Like we are all in this together. And I think understand the history of our black population, our Latinx population, the, the, you know, the Asian American population, knowing that again, like Albert pointed out, this is not a, this is not a new awakening, 
but a reawakening, like you were saying. And so I think, I think taking the time to understand, for example, like what happened to Vincent Chin, you know, um, what happened uh, in the Chinese exclusion act, what brought that down. Right. But then, but then analogizing and, 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 and understanding how those ties can tie across right to other communities. I think that also further strengthens the bond and, and has us have those aha moments like, wow, we are, you know, truly in this together. Um, but like you were saying, Ray, you got to take care of yourself, right? Take care of yourself is the best blessing to your friends. But, you know, I think, uh, I think learning a bit, right. Um, about your peers is a great first start. I know Liz, one of the things that was particularly infuriating about what happened, the tragedy in Atlanta was when the sheriff, well, first of all, that sheriff was so disgraceful about it. He thought oh, the guy had a bad day, but like almost giving the guy an excuse. Oh, it wasn't a racial thing. It was a sexual thing. Cause he had this thing for the Asian women and ate the, and so just uh, particularly from an Asian American woman perspective, your thoughts about how we have to not only confront the racial elements of this and the invisibility, but also the toxic masculinity that's tied into some of those dynamics as it impacts Asian American women. Yeah. So I think um, one thing that this moment is bringing out is um, how, how little the mainstream, you know, public and consciousness really knows about Asian American history, um, which is really tied into militarism, uh, colonialism, um, colonization, um, just all the, the, the global violence that happens um, and the, uh, in particular, military violence that happens uh, to women. Um, and all of those things kind of played out in this, this situation um, with assumptions that were made, with how the media framed it, and how it's so different from how the, the Asian media framed the story um, and uh, humanize the folks involved. Um, whereas the, the mainstream media in the U S really just kind of focused on um, the, the killer and then like started putting out all these things about his, his story. Um, so um, I think one of the, um, the most powerful forms of being a, a comrade is really um, just, you know, as, as all of you have pointed to uh, learning about, um, each other's history. Um, and for the, for Asian American communities, you know, it really looks at in, imperialism, um, militarism and, um, racism, sexism, how all of those things kind of intersect, um, which fits into how, um, how Asian American women, um, are, are perceived and, and treated uh, here in this country. Liz, I, we got to get you on clubhouse. To have that no. conversation. No, seriously, to have that kind of you, you and Ben, ain't on, you know, we obviously you can come back here whenever you want to have the conversation, but it's almost like we need a long form deal with this with a lot of people because the, the gender politics around this is so intertwined. And I'm even thinking we're not going to get into all the details of it, but I do remember LB um, even going back to the 25 year anniversary, some of the gender dynamics when it came to there were people in the movement that even wanted to minimize the role of some of the Latino and Asian American males because we weren't perceived as quote unquote masculine or like as appealing from like a leader perspective. I'm going there. It's, we'll, we're not going to get into names and, and that's a long history. But my point is that these are conversations we have to continue to have because it's part of the invisibility is taking away even like our, our humanity, our gender identity. And obviously that's a big, a larger conversation as it relates to, you know, um, you know, how, how people, how we are more inclusive now, we're trying to get more inclusive, how people identify themselves. LB, as we wrap up this segment, brother, just any thoughts you have? I mean, we could stay here for hours. This is some of, this is some of the most important conversations we have on, on the Fountain Translation Bumba Live simulcast. And I know, brother, the, I know you wanted to shout out some folks in New York, but just, you know, this is what it's about, how we figure out how we work together and support each other. Yeah, I mean, and I think, look, at the end of the day, I think what I take away from from that effort, right, um, really, I mean, I think Liz talked about it earlier in terms of the, the idea of kind of solidarity um, and, and real practical, and Ben is also talking about, I mean, real practical solidarity, right? Like, not just like some transactional thing, right, but real kind of transformable, transformational kind of relationships there, right? And, I, I, you know, the thing that always stands in my mind is that we were also dealing with, you know, stereotypes that people had of activism in general, Right. Um, of people saying, of people not remembering whether or not Latinos, you know, um, and some of that we fed into ourselves, right? I mean, I think, you know, it was interesting, um, you know, people always thought of, of and, and trying to position our Asian American friends as like the quiet ones when reality speaking, 
those were the, the the biggest people who wanted to throw down and do the most like yeah most actionable kind uh, of things right it was actually yeah. latinos in that in that time that had to be kind of brought in well, for and, to kind of do things and and i don't want to speak for for liz or anybody that's part of the movement but i also th- that was absolutely right but then part of the other dynamic was within the asian american student population right and, and then was, again, again, being political you know like, there's a, a lot of dynamics no no and there's a and, and obviously there was a lot of huge thing even and 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 even on a lot of our campuses and even today it's even more in terms of what the difference and the relationship between you know, um, for either first generation students, long term generation students, foreign students, things like that, especially in terms of at least in a, in a lot of Ivy Leagues among like Asian versus Asian American and that whole kind of dynamic, which in, in our time, certainly Latin American versus Latino was certainly something, but not to the degree in some ways that. But but I think especially during, you know, this time of Asian American, you know, heard our AAPI month in terms of thinking about, again, you're talking about a lot of times people talk about Latinos not being monolith. API communities are certainly not a monolith, right? In terms of like the different communities and cultures, you know, again, we haven't even talked or even spoken about like some of our South Asian, you know, some of our th- Southeast Asian brothers and sisters who are included in that. And so I think it really is, um, this is an opportunity for us to, to kind of not only learn more about each other, but also understand the really hideous ways in which we sometimes even put ourselves and put our some of our friends in terms of in boxes, right? And so I think part of it is figuring out how can we create a better world um, that where people can, um, you know, that we can have a sense of justice and not have to give up, you know, our cultural identities, our political identities to be able to kind of do that, right? But I do want to give a, you know, again, a strong shout out to, um, to a lot of, I think, you know, again, Asian American activists, folks who have been on the front lines. I mean, New York City, folks like, you know, Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. I mean, you're talking about people who were standing with, you know, um, you know, in terms of Puerto Rican um, activists, you know, from day one in terms of in Absolutely. New York City, um, fighting against police brutality. Um, and again, a lot of great folks who are doing a lot of great things nationally coming out of that, right? And I think it's, it's really important to understand, you know, that history um, and, and especially for younger folks to understand that there is a tradition in the history that, 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 that can be tapped into, right? And that 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 that, that hopefully, um, and in a different way, right? Like we all have different histories, right? And so I I, I just want to make sure to give a shout out, um, you know, to, to to women like you know, to women like Aijen, like Liz, like you know, Sungi Bai. Like there's a, a bunch of people who I think have certainly, um, you know, proved in their words and since their actions, um, that they're really committed to to justice, you know. No, for sure, and. Uh... And on the Kelo Kip podcast, LB, which of course is co- covering the comings and goings of Dominic- Dominicans making moves, I know you you breathe a sigh of relief that Fernando Tatis did not break his wrist the other day. So, so thank God Fernando's okay. He should be back in a few weeks. Ben, brother, take us, give us some jewels as we finish up this conversation. What can give give people another practical uh, bit of advice on what people can do uh, moving forward to show allyship and, and continue this conversation in their own circles. Absolutely. Uh, I think one more tip, right. Aside from learning the history, I think practically speaking, I'm, I think I'm similar to everyone else. When we see something terrible happening, right. Let's get trained on what to do, right. To be smart about the situation. But if you can find a a training an upstander or a bystander training, you know, uh, with all the happenings that are going out, like our, our, our communities of color, you know, need, need the support, uh, all across. So I think that's one very easy practical step. I actually attended a training this past week. It was an hour. I learned a ton. So, you know, you you could, you could do that, you know, right away. No. And I think people also have to, um, create, give Asian Americans the opportunity to, to engage in their own spaces. Obviously there's one small way I'm doing it. Um, whether it's on their media platforms and at their affinity groups and their businesses, um, you know, just, just provide Asian Americans opportunity to, to, to um, you know, to, to have space, to have this conversation, to educate us, you know, even in the chat, Liz is holding me accountable. So that's good. That's what we're here for. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, Ben brother, let's keep these conversations going. We do need to follow up. We need to do some on clubhouse really soon Absolutely. Uh, with you and Judy. And um, you know, y- y'all always have a open door here to feed the conversations here on the found translation about my life. So cast Liz, you get the final word. First of all, it's so fantastic to see you. We're always, again, that Instagram message chat. We're always talking the good, the good music stuff, but, uh, but always good conversation with you. You know how much we admire you, my friend. So just want to give you the last word on this segment on, on this moment in history and how we can keep working together. 
Well, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure to be here and catch up with all of you and to meet you, Ben. Um, so I think um, for me, one of the most important points coming out of this that I think, you know, we can focus on moving forward is um, just really the, the, the deep and pervasive need to have alternatives to the police. I think, um, you know, abolition is not just the, the end of something, but it's really the, the visioning and the growth of like what would be in its place. And so um, while we're seeing like, you know, small, you know, things pop up, we need more of those. So um, the, the safety teams that Ben was talking about um, and just really looking at all the different times when police might be involved in something, you know, whether it's like a, um, a intimate partner violence or, you know, just whatever it might be, there are always other, um, you know, organizations or resources that will be better equipped to handle that situation. And so um, I think, you know, the an idea moving forward that um, a lot of folks are working on is just um, how do we create, you know, more resources in all of our communities that can handle lots of different things, you know, they're language specific or that, you know, handle particular issues. So when something happens, the, the you know, automatic reaction isn't just to, to call the police. It's there, you know, other folks who can come in um, and safely and you know, respectfully handle the situation um, and help people work through it. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, when you're in the neighborhood and in, in these inner cities, it's, 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 it's illuminating, but also sad in that a lot of times cops get called. It's like neighborhood. It's like just intercommunication stuff. And, you know, and, and again, to your point, it's, 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 there's a lot of different types of skills where unfortunately, and even in fairness to the police that where they, we blanket, give them the responsibility to try to deal with when they're underprepared. And in some cases, not really interested in, in doing, you know, kind of making a piece in, in certain instances. So Liz Kaufman, our sister, Ben Cheng, good brother, Albert, my man. This has been a great conversation. We're going to continue the conversation after a quick break with Argentina Beltran, a Filipina leader, actually based in Toronto. Talk about the diaspora, uh, which we had a conversation earlier today. Let's continue to conversate. Ben, we need to get on Clubhouse, brother. Keep this going. Judy, 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 I need you to call me Judy. Because you're going to be a big part of Bomba Life too, and I have a, I have, I have, I just got inside information about some VIP guests we got. You're going to love it, Judy. So if you want the inside scoop, Judy, you got to call me tomorrow. But you're welcome to call me, uh, Ben, Liz. Keep these conversations going. LB, always a pleasure, brother. And uh, and again, we're going to take a quick musical break from Fabiola Mendez, who recently appeared on the show with Ben uh, on a recent episode and Judy. And then we'll, we'll we'll see our conversation with Argentina Beltran. Thank y'all, family. Have a great weekend. So great to see you. And um, let's continue to show allyship with our Asian American brothers and sisters. Pa escuchar, pero yo sí me encontré con un pajarito pequeño que mientras iba en busca el sol se topó conmigo y a mi oído cantó esta simple melodía. Pero yo sí me encontré con un pajarito pequeño que mientras iba en busca el sol se topó conmigo y a mi oído canto esta simple melodía Welcome back to Bomba Live. Uh, and the Found Translation simulcast to show the text truth about politics and today's hottest issues. And Bomba Live is our virtual celebration. And this is a very special edition of the show. Again, continue our conversations with our Asian American and Pacific Island brothers and sisters about how do we not only what's happening now with this current uh, this wave of hate directed at our API brothers and sisters, but also really spurring on the conversation of what true allyship looks like. And one of the people that I've discovered online, uh, particularly mobilizing people in the Pacific Islander and the Filipino. Uh, space and I really say the Filipino diaspora because it's not just the Filipino American community, really a global organizer. And I'm really excited to bring her onto the show. Argentina Beltran is a community collaborator and change ambassador, global connector, and brand marketing strategist, and one of the hottest moderators on Clubhouse. So I wanted to bring on the show to talk about uh, kind of give us an update from the Filipino perspective on this conversation. Argentina, welcome to Found Translation Bomba Live. Thank you so much, Rafael. It's my pleasure. Thank you. 
It is uh, first of all, you have a fantastic name, Argentina Beltran. What a wonderful name! Um, but I really, uh, I really admired uh, your leadership, particularly in the last several weeks, as it relates to mobilizing Filipinos, and I really say throughout the world because you're not a Filipino American. You're actually chiming in from Canada, our mm-hmm. friends in the north, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I am in Toronto, and I love how you said my name. Um, you said it correctly, Beltran. So it's so refreshing to hear someone that can, that can actually pronounce it properly. Well, as we're going to get into the show, there's a lot of allyship, a lot of you know, you know what I'm saying? Puerto Ricans and Filipinos have a, a lot of shared traditions, and and uh, and you know. Beltran is a very common name on the island, including Carlos Beltran, who uh, who made about three hundred million dollars playing baseball. So, kind of a hard name to forget. But you know, I, Dean, I wanted to continue this conversation with you because um, I, I wanted to make sure in this conversation earlier we spoke to uh, Liz uh, Miamang and Ben Cheng, kind of from the East Asian perspective. But you know, this is a very diverse conversation on a lot of levels, and your community has been particularly impacted most recently with some of these anti Asian attacks. So, why don't we just start from where you sit? As a leader, a uh, uh, brand marketer, uh, someone that's got their ear to the online streets, if you will, and you've been really at the centerpiece of a lot of these clubhouse conversations most recently, kind of how are you feeling as an activist and, and just uh, uh, a, a Filipino in North America sort of in this time, in this in this climate? Well, it's been a lot, right? So the last couple of weeks has been a lot of things happening. Um, so, you know, you can't help but to be worried and anxious, but at the same time, um, you know, also angry, really. Um, but the way that I process anger is through action. So when all of these things are, you know, going down, my initial thought is, what can I do, right? Um, so right now, that's where my thought process is, what more can I do? And so getting to that, not only has this scourge impacted the Asian American community broadly, but some of the more recent attacks have disproportionately impacted the Filipino community in, in this case, in the States. And so mm-hmm. can you share a little bit about sort of how is this, how is this most recent series of attacks against Filipinos specifically mobilized the Filipino community online specifically? Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that, you know, we, we talked about the the um, what we share, the Latin community and the Filipino community, what we share is our resilience, right? Um, so what this really pushed us as a community is for us to uh, mobilize and really get organizing. Um, you know, how can we create an impact um, together as a community? Because you know, you and I both know that there is definitely strength in numbers, right? So right now we're working in um, working with a bunch of different Filipino organizations, trying to bridge um, the communication, trying to bridge the gap if there's anything, um, and also trying to support any initiatives that the other organizations have already put in place so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, so that's what I've been focusing on and what my team has been focusing on in terms of how can we support and how can we amplify um, is really what we're trying to do right now. And we're talking to Argentina Beltran, uh, a Filipino uh, North American leader, someone that's very prominent in the diaspora through her social media marketing um, uh, expertise and, and at this point really utilizing that to mobilize the community. So can you share Argentina some specific examples of what uh, what you're involved in to sort of coordinate. I know there's some efforts sort of on the very day-to-day protecting, particularly Filipino senior citizens and elders and some of the more vulnerable people from your community, and then kind of moving forward. I know there's been some interesting conversations around how does this, how is this a mobilization tool to mobilize politically, for example, um, yes, in another absolutely. way. So can you share so sort we of- are trying to- Yeah, absolutely. So we're trying to, like what I mentioned earlier, um, communicating with different Filipino organization. So one is NAFA and the other is NAFCON. Um, they're one of the bigger ones in the U.S. Um, and also looking for their Canadian counterparts as well. And really looking at the initiatives that they have put in place. And as well as on the political side, because we all know this just didn't happen just a few weeks ago, a few months ago. 
Um, there has been a long history. We actually, one of the um, talks that we just had was um, really understanding and learning the long, ugly history of Asian hate, specifically from a Filipino perspective um, when it comes to, like, in the U.S. in particular, right? Um, so really understanding that and in terms of how certain policies have an impact um, in terms of how Filipinos are viewed in the U.S. Um, and also part of that work is also understanding um our history, our own history as Filipinos, um, because we were colonized so many times by, you know, not just the Spanish, the the Americans and the Japanese, right? And really understanding our culture in terms of where do we fit in there? How do we decolonize? And how do we really, really push for what is right, right? Um, so those are the type of talks that we are um, trying to put focus on. And other than that, um, you know, really strong focus as well when it comes to mental health, because it is a lot, right? Um, so really trying to show support and, and really being there as a community. We're talking to Argentina Beltran, uh, uh, one of the, our go-to Filipino leaders as it relates to uh, really mobilizing online and um, and and really just trying to have this conversation and for us to understand just because we're people of color, my case, Puerto Rican, Latino, doesn't mean that we truly understand. And I want to ask Argentina in a second, how can we truly be allies to the Philip in this case, the Pacific Islander Filipino community at this time, because we think, well, maybe we just reach out to our friends in your community, maybe go to a restaurant, you know, to show allyship. And those, I'm sure those things are nice, but what, what does it truly mean? And I'm really trying to delve into that conversation with our AAPI friends um, and, and allies and part, people that we're close to in our community. And I'll share in a second, my personal, uh, you know, personal, very deep personal connection with the Filipino community. Argentina, you know, I, I really got a sense of the mobilization happening, which on some levels really exciting. Um, and mm-hmm. on a lot of channels, really on Clubhouse, which is an app that you and I are both very involved in and you're, you know, and, and I have in the crawl here, if you're not following Philly Excellence um, on uh, on Clubhouse, I encourage you to do so and, and, and follow the conversations that Argentina's moderating with, Filipinos all over the world. It's from all different walks of life. It's fascinating conversations. So tell me about that experience sort of all of a sudden with your with your marketing, branding, and social media organizing expertise, all of a sudden on some level becoming kind of like a go-to political leader in a sense on through this app on Clubhouse. It's so interesting. Um, I joined Clubhouse not meaning to be in this position where I'm at right now. I was actually invited by one of my clients um, who is in the real estate space and to be part of the panel um, as a marketing expert. And while I was in that room, you know, one, one of the, um, one of the people that were present during that talk um She's Filipino, and and um, she just messaged me and said, "Are you Filipino?" I said, "Yeah, absolutely." And the beauty of Clubhouse is when you follow people, um, your experience is curated by the people that you follow. And because I follow her, and she was in other Filipino um, rooms, that's how I got introduced into the Filipino community inside Clubhouse. And from there, it just kind of grew um, because. You know, there is a, there is definitely hunger for um, discovering our roots, trying to, you know, connect the dots um, and really trying to figure out where do we fit in in this whole, um, like, as our Filipino identity, um, especially for people in the diaspora and also people that are um, – from the Philippines and trying to connect to the motherland, right? So having those kind of conversations and, and having those community inside the app, um, it's really fascinating the conversations that, um, that are happening. Um, and now, you know, the users have really grown so much inside that platform that all of a sudden from one to, you know, three rooms about you know, Filipino community. Now you see a bunch of them, which is really exciting. Um, but I see it like, you know, when you see a neighboring city, you all know each other kind of thing. And, and you participate in each other's conversation, which is really, which is really amazing. 
you know, Justina, I think about, and, you know, kind of my, on some level, I, I really cherish this conversation. It's time to talk to you about it because I grew up in Philadelphia and Philadelphia in that time in the eighties was very segregated. So you had, you know, mm-hmm. these different types of ethnic white neighborhoods, even the white people were segregated. The Irish lived in one area, the Italians lived in one area, mm-hmm. you know, what have you. And then, you know, there was a lot of segregated black neighborhoods and then sort of, you know, sort of in between some of the poor black areas and some of the poor white neighborhoods, sort of a Puerto Rican Latino mm-hmm. corridor was created. Mm-hmm. And basically the Filipinos were a small community. They had nowhere else to live. So they lived with us. So my neighbors, and particularly because of the Catholic cultural connection, mm-hmm. I think, you know, that, that the Filipino family sent their kids to the local Catholic school in the hood, you know? So mm-hmm. my, I remember from like kindergarten to third grade, my best friend was a Filipino young guy, mm-hmm. ben, Benjamin Palacios. I remember, and I'm still in touch with his cousin, Sarah, who's a nurse in the Philadelphia area to this day. And those families are still close to us. And so yeah. when I was growing up, allied ship was sort of like part of the deal. Like, you know, it was much, we didn't really see any much of a difference. If anything, there were so many similarities with language, culture. And, and if, um, you know, people don't know that history, I encourage you to look into it because of the colonial relationship with Spain. Absolutely. Culturally, there's a lot of connections between religion and, 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 uh, and, and, and being Islanders and, and a lot mm-hmm. of similarities. And so, you know, but fast forwarding, you know, yeah, we have some friends in the network, and, um, you know, it's certainly a community that, you know, that I that that I have a lot of love for. But at the same time, I can't I'm not going to sit here and say that I've spent a lot of time engaging in these thought in, in a lot of these issues from that lens. And so that's why your rooms on Clubhouse are so captivating to me. I listen to them. I, it, I'm i so compelled because I realize, A, it's just great to hear a dim perspective. But on some level, and that's kind of the, the one of the beautiful things about some of these social media platforms. Where else am I going to get this? Where else mm-hmm. am I going to hear, you know, people that I very much culturally can relate to, but it is a different slice of the pie, you know, mm-hmm. and it's a different, a distinct experience. And in your case, not even being in the United States, being in Canada, but, you know, just having these compelling conversations with people that get very little attention in the media. And I know there's some people that are sort of in the media that a lot of you go to because you're so excited to see some of that representation, even though a lot of it's kind of behind the camera. So I just think on a, on a personal level, it's, it's been, it's been a real education for me and really rewarding just to hear that perspective and have somewhere to hear it and, and be able to learn from what's happening. So, and, and I would say this, that, and I wonder if you agree with this Argentina, that I think in some ways the Filipino community could be the conduit for the non-Asian American minority communities, you know, particularly Latinos, the way Puerto Ricans sometimes are sort of the conduit with the black community and Latinos because of our distinct cultural background. Um, so are you finding that, 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 that sort of Filipinos are almost kind of the connective tissue to, to, so to discuss the bigger conversation about allyship? It's so interesting that you mentioned that because, you know, we were, we, we always have this conversation, you know, when you're filling out a form, which one do you choose? Asian, Latino, Pacific Islander for Filipinos specifically, right? Cause we're a mix of everybody yeah. really. Hey, well, oh, yeah. Um, But um, in some ways, yes, because there is, I'm sure you can relate to this because when I enter a Latin room, for example, it's so different, but something about it feels so familiar. Um, So that's probably how you feel as well. So it's similar to like me attending a Latino party, you know, somehow it feels so familiar to me and um something about the the shared culture um i think is is what it is um and also our shared struggles right um so as a, as people there's definitely that connection and that bond um and i don't know if i can actually say that filipinos would be the conduit between the um Asian and the Latino community, but I can see that just because we are, we are essentially both. Right. Um, so there's, there's definitely connection in, in both aspects of our Asianness and, and our, um, being part of that Latino being, you know, having the same colonizers. Right. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I, I can see how, how that can be perceived as that. I got so excited because I was, and I think I DM'd you at that point, listening to that conversation on Clubhouse the other day. It was really compelling. You had a great group there, and it was really great conversation. But then the conversation went into adobo and tostones, and I'm like, hold on here. Come on now. This is, you know, this is, uh, this is very relatable. And, of course, Argentina, Puerto Ricans and Filipinos mm. have created one of the greatest talents that, mm-hmm. that blesses our country, the world. Of course, I'm talking about Bruno Mars. So without yeah. us, there's no Bruno. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So uh, uh, Bruno, so I can't argue with that. <laughs> without without us, there's no Bruno. So what an incredible no, talent, no, no. Good man. So, and I know, hey, we 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 both share the credit, so I, I can't take away from <laughs> that. His mother actually was the singer. She he got his voice from his mother. Um, mm. She was very. She died very young. Rest in peace, that woman. But, um, but Argentina, as we wrap this conversation, remind people they can connect with you on social media because between Clubhouse and your social media marketing and brand ambassadorship expertise, you're someone we definitely want to connect with for business and for continue these activism conversations. And anything else you'd like to share with uh, with the Latino community? You know, how can Latinos continue to be allies in this? Unfortunately, this is not going to go away. We're going to share a lot of these struggles together. The immigration yeah. fight is something we're doing together. So share with us how we can connect, stay connected with you and anything else to like to share with our audience. Well, to connect with me, I, you know, I'm Gabe and Angel, which is the name of my kids. Um, that's my handle on all social media platforms. Um, and also, how do we form an allyship? I always go back to when it, whenever there's a talk about allyship, um, I always go back to saying um, supporting the anti-Asian movement is supporting the Black Lives Matter movement Um, because really a lot of the racism that's existing in the world right now is rooted in anti-Blackness. And by us, I'm talking about the BIPOC community refusing to play the um, this is Um, Asians against black or any other races, I refuse to play that because really that's the white supremacist way of dividing us, right? Because if we can be divided, then we can be manipulated and we can be controlled. Um, So, you know, there's really no talk of, you know, stop Asian hate or anything like that without mentioning the, um, the plight of the black community. So really supporting their movement, supporting the anti-racism movement that other communities um, have endured uh, for a long, long time is really how you show allyship. You don't support one race and then um, blame the other. That's not how it's going to work. Wow, what a powerful message. Thank you so much, Argentina. Next time I have you on the show, I actually want to talk about twinning because of your twins. I have we have some other friends in the network that are raising twins, so that would be a great conversation. I know you were you were connecting with some other some of the folks you were interviewing on Instagram on that recently. Argentina Beltran, uh just a, a, a fantastic businesswoman, brand ambassador. Definitely encourage you to keep following her at Gabe and Angel. And we're going to continue the conversations on Clubhouse and on all of our platforms about how we continue to uh, show allyship with the Asian American Pacific Island community. And, you know, a lot of love for our Filipinos always. Argentina, thank you so much and, and hope to have you back on the show very soon. Muchas gracias. <laughs>